Welcome attendees. You find yourself in the right place at the Loyola Academy Virtual College Fair. We will be starting at exactly eight o'clock, so we'll just be two minutes. We will get started shortly. Thank you all for joining us. All right, welcome everyone. We will get started in just about 30 seconds. Perfect. All right, looks like we have everyone here, so we are going to get started. Welcome everyone to the Loyola Academy Virtual College Fair. We have wonderful six presenters today who will be joining us from universities. If you have any questions for our panelists, please use the Q&A button to ask them their questions. They will get back to you either privately or through a direct message on the Q&A chat. The chat feature officially is not available. Your cameras are off and microphones are off as well. Please sign up for the rest of the sessions for the conference and this recording will be available at strivescan.com slash Loyola. And I would like to invite our first panelist up from Suffolk University, Patrick. Awesome, thank you so much. Let me start off by sharing my screen. Let's see, we'll pull up my PowerPoint for the day. And I am Patrick Dean. I'm one of the admissions counselors here from Suffolk University. And to show you exactly where we're located, we are located right in the heart of downtown Boston, Massachusetts. I don't know how many of you have ever been to Boston before, but if you've ever gone to the city and walked around the common, went to the Granary Burying Ground where Paul Revere, uh, Sam Adams, John Hancock are buried, or went over to the old Massachusetts State House to see where the Boston Massacre took place, there's a good chance that you've actually walked all throughout our campus being downtown. We're surrounded by all the different sports teams, companies, historical sites, MBTA stations to take you anywhere you need to go in the city. And our students are really perfectly situated to take advantage of everything that Boston has to offer. Kind of a cool fun fact about the sports teams, Tremont Street right over here that cuts right down the middle of our campus is where all the teams take their victory parades. So we kind of joke around and say students end up turning into Boston sports fans because they know if a team wins a championship, you get the day off from class because the parades will go right through your classes. To talk a little bit about the academics here, we have just over 70 undergraduate programs that students can take part in. Um, a lot of students like to go into the business school, focus on anything ranging from marketing, finance, entrepreneurship, even going into specifics like big data and business analytics, which is a field that is rapidly expanding nowadays. A lot of our students like to come here for anything in government and also political science. Right over my shoulder here, you can see the Massachusetts State House with our buildings being right behind my head over here. So we're extremely close to the State House, and that means extremely close to internships. Boston City Hall is back down that way too. And we also have great partnerships with the Washington Center and our state representatives and senators down in Washington, DC. So that way students can get involved in all levels of government. 
we also have some niche majors that students can take part into, like radiation science and radiation therapy, um, helping work with chemotherapy pa uh, patients. A lot of our students end up going to Mass Gen right down the street from us, which is, I believe, right now the number two hospital in the country. And then we also have graphic design too, which is a really great program. And our students take part in a lot of the great historical sites in the city, helping refurbish some of them and put their own personal spin on it. Right now we have a student faculty ratio of 15 to one and an average class size of just about 21 students. Probably my favorite statistic is that 99% of our students are working or in graduate school within a year after graduation. And a lot of that has to do with our focus on hands-on learning. So we wanna get you out of the classroom and into the city as soon as possible. Academics is gonna be the keystone to any college experience, but it's not the only thing to your college experience. So we also have just over 100 clubs and organizations that students can get involved in. I believe Video Gamers Army, Women in Business, and Black Student Union are ones that have been rapidly expanding recently. So we're, all, we're super happy to see that. Same with Student Government Association, taking a large role in being a leadership for students, being the voice for the students, and also planning a lot of events like a concert starring Post Malone not too long ago that we have. We also offer a ton of alternative break trips that students can take part in and a bunch of community service. Like I've said during this presentation, the city of Boston gives us so much, so we wanna give back to the city as much as we possibly can. Right now we have 19 NCAA Division III teams playing in the Commonwealth Coastal Conference. Um, our men's baseball team just recently won, our men's indoor track and field team recently won a championship. Our women's hockey coach was just playing in the WNHL, uh, making her the only uh, NCAA coach playing in the WNHL. She actually donated all of her shirt sales back to the campus to Suffolk Cares, which is a charity that helps at need students. So our athletes really do play a large role on campus. And yes, it is possible to do athletics in the city at all of the different sporting complex that we have either on campus or in the East Boston Sports Complex. We also are very well known at Suffolk for opening up the world to our students. Probably the biggest opportunity for that is our very own campus located in Madrid, Spain. Here you have the opportunity to study for as little as a summer or a semester to as much as two semesters, two years, or if you wanna do international relations, you can actually spend all four of your years at the Madrid campus. It's also home to our Global Gateway Program, which is honestly one of my favorite programs that we offer. And it's really geared towards students who are a little bit unsure of studying abroad or gaining international experiences because this is where you take your first year spring break and you get to spend it at the Madrid campus. It's probably the easiest and least expensive way to spend spring break in Madrid and it's perfect for getting your feet wet and really getting to enjoy everything that campus has to offer in the location of the university district of the city. Besides that, we have over 50 programs that you can work with in over 30 countries. There's also additional ways to travel with some of our semester abroad, academic year abroad, faculty-led study tours that last usually just a week. And then we also have um, travel seminars that also last just a week. Right now, 19% of our student population is made up of international students, making us the third highest percentage in the country. Of our domestic population, 34% identify as students of color. And we offer just about 20 cultural affinity groups on campus to really showcase our diversity. Right now, to app for applications, we either accept the common application or the Suffolk application. Your high school transcript, essay, and one letter of recommendation. We are test optional, so you absolutely do not need to submit any test scores at all for us if you don't want to. If you want to submit test scores, you can self-report them to us, so you don't have to worry about paying College Board or paying for your scores to send in. For early action, November 15th is our deadline. Regular decision is February 15th, and we are rolling after that. If we have any seniors in the room right now, we are still accepting applications as of this time because we are rolling after our deadlines. All students are automatically considered for merit-based scholarships, and the only thing we require for financial aid is the FAFSA, no CSS profile, or anything like that. That's pretty much it for me. Thank you all so much for taking time to learn a little bit about Suffolk University and I'll pass it on to the next presenter. Excellent. Thank you so much, Patrick. We have April. Of Hello, everyone. How are you guys tonight? I hope you're well. My name is April Lynch. I'm an Associate Director of Admission here with Syracuse University, and I get to kind of talk to you tonight about everything Syracuse. So we are located in upstate New York. Uh, we are a two-hour direct flight out of O'Hare, or you can take the Amtrak out of Union Station, goes right to Syracuse as well. So it's very easy to get back and forth from Loyola uh, Academy, and we have about 15,000 undergrads, a few thousand grad students here on campus. We're firmly in that mid-size range for institutions. We are 
we have about a 15 to 1 student faculty ratio and an average class size of about 26 students. With that said, about 60% of our classes have 20 or fewer students in them. We really value getting you guys connected with your peers, with your professors, forming those relationships um, so that you feel comfortable talking and reaching out and reaching your full potential. Now, we have several different academic colleges here that you guys can consider joining. There's over 200 majors and 100 minors here. Um, so you can see all of the academic colleges listed there, as well as some of the rankings we have, the small snippet of our rankings. Um, but each of those academic colleges that you see before you, the ones that have the orange asterisks next to it, is an academic college you can join as an undecided student. So if you're truly undecided, you have no idea what you want to do, typically we encourage you to look at one of the liberal arts, um, maybe the College of Arts and Sciences, because we are liberally arts based. If you know that, for example, you'd like to be a business student, you can actually apply to our Martin J. Whitman School of Management as an undecided business student. That gets you started in that academic area and allows you to kind of explore and then choose your major in there. But don't worry, we have plenty of advisors who are there to kind of help you through that whole process. Um, each of our students that comes here finds something unique and different about Syracuse. And I'm, I'm trying to throw in some fun pictures uh, because we know that not all of you have had a chance to come out and visit us. Um, we would love to have you come out as soon as we are fully open for visitors. You can keep checking our website on that. But what I do want to talk about a little bit more is some of our advising options. You will have three advisors when you come to Syracuse. So the first is an academic advisor. This is someone who will help you pick out classes, go over and make sure that you're staying on track academically. The second is a career advisor. So someone will help you look at internships, who work with you in your cover letters, your resume, doing mock interviews, um, help you find shadowing opportunities or you know, just job searching when it comes time. We also have um, a peer mentor who is another advisor, a student that is in the academic major that you're in, who will walk through everything with you as well and be there as a sounding board and answer questions and just kind of be someone else, a friendly face to get you through that. You can see a small snippet of the internships that some of our students have had in the last year or so. Um, and we encourage you get an internship, at least one before you graduate. Most of our students have at least one and many have four, five, six, you know, depending on what their interest is. We are also a research one institution, which is the top tier of research. And we encourage you guys, join a research team if that's of interest to you. You can start off by talking to someone in our Office of Undergraduate Research. It's called The Source. You can be part of many of our different research projects going on on campus. We also have other fun things to do. So we have a flight simulator. It's a NASA quality flight simulator that's located in our aerospace engineering department. We have the student sandbox, the invent SU. So different ways to kind of pitch ideas and get your ideas and inventions out there. We also have a very robust study abroad program. We are one of the top ranked programs in the country. There's over 100 different programs in 60 countries. We have five abroad centers. So these are locations where we have our own buildings. We have our own full-time faculty teaching. Um, and you can go to any of those pretty much at any point. Those locations are London, Madrid, Strasbourg, Florence, and Santiago. If you want to do that full immersion program, again, those 100 other programs in the 60 countries are a great choice for you. We also have a discovery program, which is first semester freshman year. You can actually start by studying abroad at one of our abroad centers. And we have three other campuses here in the US. So besides our main campus in Syracuse, we have one in New York City, one in Washington, DC, and one out in LA. Being orange is something that we are excited and passionate about, and we hope you are too. We are division one for athletics. If you have not seen our school spirit, um, please come join us. It is a very real thing. We love being orange. We love cheering on our teams, as well as our competitive uh, program. So if a sales team goes to competition, we're very excited for them as well. But there are over 300 clubs, athletics and organizations for you guys to join. There is truly something for everybody out there. If you would like to join Greek life or do a volunteer activity or join an acapella group or a book club, like there is something for you. Please, please take a look at that. We have so many things going on on campus. Our Orange After Dark program sets up activities for you to go to local areas and maybe go ice skating with Otto or um, 
you can go to our, we have MLK events here and we do a book club each year. So we read Trevor Noah's Born a Crime as a group. And then he came out during our MLK events about two years ago now and led a big discussion on it. And we do that every year with a different author. So, you know, again, engage with us. We'd love for you to do that. The barn center at the Arch is newly renovated. It opened about a year ago. And the whole building is a one-stop wellness shop. So we want your whole self to be helped and healed in this area. So there's, of course, physical. So you can work out in the facilities. There are basketball courts, as far as the eye can see, tracks, um, obviously the pool. There's a climbing wall, machines, weight, ellipticals, all that stuff. The other half of the building is full of our counseling offices. We have a pharmacy. Um, we have an esports area. We have a pet therapy area in case you'd like to snuggle with a puppy. So there, again, we want the whole you to be healthy as you do this. Um, then the Shine Student Center was also recently renovated. The Shine, uh, we pulled in different student groups from across the campus and placed a lot of those cultural centers in the Shine so that students had easier access to the programming and the support services that these offered. So our Office of Multicultural Affairs, LGBT Resource Center and Disability Cultural Center are now located in the Shine. Living Orange, all of our freshmen and sophomores are required to live on campus with us. We have so many different housing options for you. We also have living learning communities, which I would encourage you to think about. This means you can live with other students within a major like academic area. You could live with someone with the same interest. Maybe you wanna live in a multicultural living learning community. There's a lot of ways for you to do that. And by joining the Orange, you become part of our family and our alumni who help us in each way. We are a member of the Common App. We are test optional for the class of 22, and we look forward to working with you guys in the future. Thanks so much for joining me. Thank you so much, April. All right, our next presenter, please. Hello everyone, hopefully you can see my screen. My name is Hope Alchin and I'm an admissions officer at Washington University in St. Louis. I do represent students in the Chicago land area. This is gonna be just a brief introduction to WashU. So I'm gonna start with just five things to know as you're considering our campus. However, there are many other ways to engage with WashU. So far from covering a comprehensive overview. So to get started, we're going to move from the East Coast to the Midwest, and I'm going to introduce you to the city of St. Louis. So as you may have guessed from our name, Washi was located in St. Louis, which is a mid-sized city of about 3 million people in our metro population. We're a quick four and a half hour drive south of Chicago, so a really quick drive for all of you at Loyola. Um, St. Louis is such a vibrant city, and as someone who is from the city of Chicago, I feel confident in saying that St. Louis has equally great parks, amazing food, and well, can't promise on the sports teams. I am a Chicago Cubs fan and the Cardinals just will never cut it, um, but amazingly cheap ticket prices, which are so fun for all of our students to explore. We, I live downtown, which is seven miles from our main campus, or I should say our only campus, but our campus there, you can traverse that in an easy 15 minutes on the Metro in St. Louis. All of WashU students get free access to the Metro and free doesn't stop there. St. Louis is the, one of the most, most affordable cities in the country and we have more free attractions than any other city in the United States besides Washington, DC. Lots to do, so much that is there to explore beyond the campus of WashU itself. That being said, of course, you came here to learn about WashU. So I do wanna mention where our students call home when they're on campus itself, and that is within our different undergraduate divisions. As a senior, you're gonna apply directly into one of our undergraduate divisions. This is kind of point two here. Our largest division by far is our College of Arts and Sciences. It is the liberal arts hub of the university, so home to the natural sciences, the social sciences, the humanities. We do have four smaller direct entry programs as well, so the four other divisions are art, architecture, business, as well as engineering. So while you do make that initial choice, um, you're also welcome to apply into our special programs like the joint program in business and computer science or Beyond Boundaries, which is an interdisciplinary cohort experience. Um, so you do make that initial choice, but it's, it's far from binding. 75% of our students at WashU will graduate with more than a major. So a major and a minor, a major and two minors, a double major and a minor. And the 
occasional double major and double minor um, are all things that our students can explore and many, many do take advantage of. You're not restricted to just one division. You can major and minor and take classes across them. And we are known for our academic flexibility as well as our amazing different programs with more than a hundred across all of our different fields of study. Of course, there are other things that our students come to. And it's not just the home in our, res in our academics, but our residence life as well. I do wanna to point to our undergraduate student profile. At WashU, all of our first year students do live on campus at WashU in a place called the South 40. However, um, I think the number now is 80% of our students choose to live on campus for all four years despite that just one year requirement. And I think that is a testament to our amazing housing and food on campus. I also think it's a testament to our community. At WashU, we are deeply committed to bringing students together from all over the country as well as all over the world. You're looking at our student body, we value a difference in perspective, right? We're looking for students who are from all sorts of different walks of life, whether that is the state they are coming from, whether that is their socioeconomic class, whether that is their race, ethnicity, academic interests, religion, all of those things are coming together to create a really vibrant and engaging class of students who are excited to learn from each other, both in the classroom and out. This is something I can't emphasize enough, how important this experience is of meeting people who are different than you. It is inherent to being a WashU student is making friends who probably grew up in a different circumstance than you. And we really, really love that on our campus community. There are a few things that bring WashU together though. And I think one I probably said already is that we're known for being collaborative. We are a super collaborative space and that is something that our students really enjoy. And I feel that as a natural lead in, of course, to our in the classroom experience. Main takeaway here is that we offer hundreds of classes across our different academic areas. Most of them are gonna be small seminar experiences where you get to know your faculty from day one. WashU has a whole set of first year experiences. We do guarantee that every student is going to have that small classroom experience in any of their semesters, regardless of their academic program of study. We have some really amazing faculty and some impressive ones as well as do all of my peers on this panel. Also, if you're interested in engaging with them, they are more than welcome to, you're more than welcome to reach out and start that conversation even now. That being said, besides the academic experience, WashU students are doing so much more. Our students are going abroad. I saw a question about in the chat, but something that's certainly available at WashU. We have more than a hundred abroad programs offered through WashU um, that offer credit, including at least one with each of our different departments on campus. You can start a business through our STEP program. And we have businesses right on campus. Right now we have things like a candy store and a hairdresser, um, a bike rental and a laundry service. You could do research um, in any academic department. And of course you can engage in the city of St. Louis. Um, through civic service. With, that all in, with all of that in mind, we do also have more than 400 student organizations for you to join. So I always say there's no excuse to get bored on WashU's campus. There is so much to do. All right, that was a lot of information. Hopefully you heard that and you're like, wow, I would love to at least consider joining the WashU community. And with that in mind, here's some brief things about our application process. You do have the choice of applying through either early decision or a regular decision round. We're also a QuestBridge math partner. With that in mind, you can see the different things you may need to apply here. We are test optional for the class of 2026, um, as well as the class of 2025. If you would like more details on any of these requirements, please feel free to reach out to our office or attend one of our full length information sessions, which will go into this in detail. The last thing I did want to always end with is that WashU is committed to meeting 100% of demonstrated financial need for all of our students. And so you might see that sticker price there in the corner. Make sure you reach out to our office. We are committed to working with students to make sure WashU is an affordable education for every family. All right, with that, I have definitely taken my six minutes. Here's a quick way to um, connect. I will put it in the chat. I'll also put my email there as well. So back to you, Thank Peter. You. Thank you so much, Hope, and hope you have uh, questions in the Q&A as well for uh, some people that are directed at, at WashU specifically, so you want to check that out. And next we have Dickinson College up. Hey, let's go. Hey, Rylan, what's up? Hey, everyone. Rylan Good, Associate Director of Admissions at Dickinson College in Central Pennsylvania, coming to you live from my apartment. Um, so I'm going to use my six minutes to really give you a sense of the values of Dickinson. Um, as you embark on this pr uh, process, I know that it can be a little daunting, so I'm not going to spend too much time on stats and statistics because you can find a lot of that on our website. Um, but really, we're a small liberal arts and science college. Um, we have around 2,400 students from 48 different countries and about 45 different states. Your average class size at Dickinson is only going to be about 14 students per class with a student to faculty ratio of 8 to 1. 
45 different majors, but most importantly, about a third of our students major in something international, and then about half of our students major in an interdisciplinary area. So the two main things I really want to talk about. Number one is going to be that international piece. Um, so as you walk onto our campus, you're going to find kind of this global signpost. And so what this global signpost signifies is going to be the 18 global programs that Dickinson operates all around the world. And so a lot of my colleagues have already talked about study abroad, but Dickinson does it a little bit different. We actually operate our own programs in 15 different countries, um, really making sure the study abroad is accessible to all of our students, affordable, um, but then also gives you a lot of different opportunities. Um, so that's landed us in the number two spot um, on the Princeton Review for most popular study abroad programs. Um, about 50% of our science majors study abroad. So even if you're thinking about studying STEM, um, you can study abroad. And then about 60% of our student athletes study abroad. So there are no barriers at Dickinson for you, for you to get abroad and to experience the world. But let's say you never leave Carlisle, Pennsylvania, and you stay at Dickinson for all four years. We want you to still have a global experience. And so we have a kind of a unique requirement within higher ed. We do require all of our students to study a modern world language, um, regardless of your major. Um, but unlike a lot of high schools that may have only two or three world languages, Dickinson actually has 13 world languages to choose from. And so maybe you want to try out Japanese or Arabic or Hebrew or uh, modern Greek. You can do that at Dickinson, even if you've never taken that language at Loyola. Um, fun fact, Dickinson was the first college in the United States to offer modern world languages back in 1790. And all of this is because we believe that your generation are more connected than any other generation before you, um, and that you're going to go out into a global, globally connected world. And we want you to be prepared to be a global citizen. The second pillar of a Dickinson education that I really want to focus on is really our focus on the fight against climate change and sustainability efforts. As I talk with students all around the world, you know, and I ask you, what is the greatest threat to your generation? Nine out of 10 times you say climate change. And so Dickinson is a place that's actually doing something about it. So last year in 2020, Dickinson became one of only eight institutions in the entire country to officially go carbon neutral. So this means that Dickinson is not contributing to climate change. And that's landed us in the number one spot for sustainability. Um, but on top of that, my favorite part of our Dickinson campus um, is our 180 acre organic certified farm. And so you can uh, volunteer or work at the farmer's market every Wednesday in downtown Carlisle. I know pizza is a huge thing in Chicago. Um, we have our own brick oven, so you can make pizzas using ingredients from the farm. And so if I had to encourage you to follow one Instagram account on Dickinson, it would be the college farm because it's amazing food and the cutest animals that you'll, you'll ever see. But on top of that, we also require all of our students to take a sustainability class because our goal of a Dickinson education is again, for you to become a global citizen who's concerned about the world around you. So between global engagement and our focus on sustainability, those are really the value systems that we have in place at Dickinson. And that's what eventually gets us here. 98% um, of our students are employed or in graduate school within one year of graduating. If you're thinking about law school, we have a 94% acceptance rate in the law school. If you're thinking about medical school, we have a 95% acceptance rate in the medical school. Um, if you're thinking about going abroad after your time at Dickinson, Dickinson is a top 10 liberal arts for Fulbright and Peace Corps volunteers. And then the logos in front of you are where Dickinsonians end up. So if you're familiar with Justin's Nut Butter, he's a Dickinson grad. If you're familiar with L.L. Bean, the president and CEO is a Dickinson grad. Uh, the New York Knicks, the president Leon Rose is a Dickinson grad. So Dickinson grads go out into the world, make the world a better place, but also become very successful in their careers. And then finally, admissions and financial aid. We have two deadlines, November 15th for early decision one, and then January 15th for early decision two and regular decision. Dickinson was one of the uh, few schools that actually switched from test optional to test blind um, because we were test optional since 1994. Um, and that is for both admission and scholarship consideration. 
And then finally, in terms of merit scholarships, we offer 15 to $35,000 per year in merit scholarships. And like Washington University of St. Louis, um, Dickinson does meet 100% of demonstrated financial need for all of our accepted students. And you can find us on the Common App and you can find me in the uh, chat. So if you have any questions, throw them in the Q&A and happy to answer them there. Excellent, thank you, Ryland. You do have a couple questions in there. So we will go next to William and Mary with David. Thank you so much, David. All right, thank you. Uh, first off, um, just want to say that I'm very happy to be here. Um, I'm going to try to just share here, but I'm basically going to talk over the, the slide here. Uh, glad to be with you guys. Uh, I took some time living in Chicago a long time ago and actually lived about two miles from the Loyola campus uh, down by the corner of Lake and Hunter and attended a rather large public high school in Winnetka, Illinois. So uh, but very familiar with Loyola over the years, um, know all about your, your programs, your Clavia scholars, your Dumbback scholars, and, and all that fun stuff. So I've uh, been enjoy reading your applications uh, for a long, long time. So I uh, do want to talk a little bit about uh, some of the basics on William and & Mary, and I apologize for not having a lot up here. We're still uh, reading applications this year, and uh, but uh, you can see that William & Mary is in, in uh, Williamsburg, Virginia, South Central. Uh, Virginia. So we're about two and a half hours uh, south of Washington, D.C. So very accessible. It's also a completely different climate from Chicago. I have lived here since 1999 and I have never had a snowplow come down my road. Uh, and most winters, I don't even need to shovel a thing. So we do get snow. It's just not going to be a, a big part of the winter. And, uh, and if we do get some, it's usually gone within a day or two. So it's a, it's a rather large event in, in Williamsburg when we do get uh, any any snow at all. So uh, moving on, I do want to mention, uh, some of you may know William Mary is the second oldest college in the United States. We have a rather unique history. We were founded as a British college by the King and Queen of England. Uh, so, you know, we were a British college before we became an American college. And we actually were founded as a private institution. And now we're a public institution. Uh, we became a public institution in the Commonwealth of Virginia in 1906. So uh, we're a rather unique institution in the, in the higher ed landscape uh, in that uh, we're a medium-sized, highly competitive public institution. And there really isn't another uh, school like that. We actually are um, also the oldest university in the United States. We actually debate that with the University of Pennsylvania. But uh, I think like some of the other folks have, have talked about, I want to talk a little bit about, um, you know, who's a good fit for William & Mary? Why, why might you be attracted there? Because I think all of us uh, want to help you in that process, right? You're all looking at the 4,000 colleges and universities in the United States, and it uh, uh, can be challenging to narrow things down. But uh, I think like most institutions, we're, we're clearly looking for students who are intellectually curious, right? Um, you can certainly have an idea about what you want to major in, but you uh, can be completely undecided as well. And I think that's something we all appreciate about higher ed. There's just so much more to offer uh, than what high school uh, has to offer you. And so that engagement with the intellectual process and being open to uh, new thoughts and ideas, uh, engaging with other students, faculty, et cetera, things of that sort is um, definitely is something that's important to us uh, in the application process. So that means we like to see you do a fair amount of breadth and depth in the high school experience. So uh, from our end, we like to see students who are challenging themselves with the best courses they can, right? Like the students who take the best courses and get the best grades uh, in their school are going to be very strong candidates at very strong institutions. So uh, we like to see kids do a bio biology, chemistry, and physics program in high school. We like to see you do through calculus uh, in math, and we like to see you complete the fourth level of any one language. So uh, those aren't requirements, but that gives you the breadth and depth to come into William and Mary and explore any program that we offer uh, and be successful at it. So uh, that's just something to think about for those of you who might be uh, sophomores or juniors who are sitting here on the panel. That uh, selection process uh, can be very important to you. So. But I do want to talk a little bit about what's, what are you more likely to do if you attend William and & Mary. Uh, and, and so, for example, uh, as a public institution, we are a little different from other schools on this panel, but we do, uh, you're more likely, obviously, engage with your faculty, right? 
we have an 11 to 1 student faculty ratio, which is the smallest of any national uh, public school in the United States. So we do have very small classes. We don't have large lecture halls. We don't use graduate students to teach our courses. You're getting full faculty uh, all the time. So in many ways, we, we operate like a private institution. Um, you're also more likely to study abroad than in any other public school in the United States. Uh, over 60% of our students study abroad. Um, so uh, like many of the other schools, uh, that's a great, great program. One area where we're probably a little different is that faculty mentored research is a huge thing at William & Mary. Uh, we're, we're you know, 6,300 undergraduates. We only have a couple of thousand graduate students here. So our faculty are engaging a lot with our undergraduate students to assist them in their research. And so we're actually at about an 80% rate uh, in terms of faculty mentored research. So you are very, very likely to engage in faculty mentored research outside of normal classwork. And that can start as early as freshman year. So plenty of opportunities there. In terms of engagement, uh, yes, everybody has an opportunity to get involved in clubs and organizations. We just happen to have a ton of them. We have uh, almost 500 clubs and organizations, which is a very large number for a school our size. Uh, so you name it, you can get involved in it. Uh, you know, so we have, for example, not one, two, three, or four acapella groups. We're up to 12 different acapella groups. We have four different improv groups. We've actually had a number of alums work uh, at Second City uh, over the years. So a lot going on in that area. Uh, and, and all of those opportunities are available for you, regardless of your major or your program. Um, we are not a place where uh, you can't, you can certainly come here and be a chemistry major and a theater minor, right? Those things are very common here. You can take music classes and never ever uh, have to be a major in that area. The arts are extremely vibrant here and incredibly available to you. Uh, I think uh, a few other schools have mentioned this. You're also more likely to graduate with more than a major. Um, we do restrict you to just a major, a major and a minor, or a double major. Um, so basically, by you know incorporating about your all of your electives to another major, you can get that double major. We're a little different from a lot of highly competitive schools in the country these days in that we still are fairly um, liberal with our AP or IB or community college credit. So if you have AP credits, uh, four or five, um, that's going to give you some opportunities to have some advanced standing give you some flexibility to fit some things in. Uh, we're probably unique among a lot of public schools in that you're probably less likely to graduate early from William and Mary than late uh, because of that extra flexibility, but a lot of students enjoy that uh, just to be able to take other courses that they want. So uh, the other thing that you'll find at William and Mary is that a lot of our students go on to graduate school, okay? Um, over 60% of our alumni will go on to get an advanced degree. And in fact, we're the top public institution in the United States for the percentage of alumni who go on to get a PhD. Uh, one of those uh, persons was actually, uh, just to pick on my colleague here at Wash U, is now the chancellor of Wash U, uh, who was a uh, government and math major at William & Mary. So uh, we're also actually in the top 20 overall among all national universities for the percentage of alumni who go on to get a PhD. Obviously, we have all the pre-med, pre-law, pre-whatever, pre-engineering programs that you'd want uh, to prepare you for that. Uh, and also, most importantly, in terms of what you're more likely to be if you come to William & Mary, uh, is happy. Uh, we've been ranked uh, number seven, number one, and number four in the Princeton Review in the last three years. So um, obviously, I'd be happy to answer any questions in the chat room. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, David. You do have a couple of questions in there for you. And uh, we have our last presentation with St. Olaf College. And I want to remind everyone who is participating today that you can use the Q&A to uh, ask any questions to any of the panelists that have presented already today. Suffolk University, Syracuse University, Wash U. Dickinson College and William and Mary can all answer your questions in the Q&A. And now we'll give it off to St. Olaf College. All right, hopefully that is coming up for you all. Um, hi, I'm Emily Oberto. Yeah, we're good, okay. Um, I'm Emily Oberto and I'm an Assistant Dean of Admissions at St. Olaf College. 
which is located in Northfield, Minnesota, which is a small town of about 20,000 people. And Northfield is about 45 minutes south from the Twin Cities here in Minnesota. So I actually live in Minneapolis. When we were in the office, I commute down because um, it's not too far to get from the airport or anything like that. And I'd say it's about a six hour drive um, from the Chicagoland area. So also a pretty easy drive and lots of Oli's to share rides with back for the holidays. About 40% of our students come from Minnesota. 10% um, of our students are international students. And then I would say a pretty big chunk of students do come from Illinois. Um, outside of that, we have students from all 50 states. So you really do get the sense of interacting with people who are coming from a lot of different places. St. Olaf's campus is about 3,000 students, and we actually share the town of Northfield with another college, Carleton College. They have about 1,800 students. So for being a small private liberal arts college, we're a little bit on the bigger end. Some of them are really small, um, but it's a nice size where you know a lot of people, but you're not going to know necessarily everybody that you graduate with. A big reason that students choose St. Olaf College is for the academics. I would say that St. Olaf students are very collaborative. They are very self-motivated. They really have passions for learning, but those passions take them in a lot of different directions. We're really well known for STEM and specifically the sciences and pre-health. We have a really strong pre-med program with um, almost 70% of students getting into medical school on their first try. We're also really well known for music and the fine arts. We have fully accredited majors in all four areas of art. So music, dance, theater, and studio art. Um, the cool thing about music at St. Olaf is that about a third of our students participate in music, but only a third of them are majors. So with all of our art programs, you don't have to be a major to still participate. A lot of students just kind of get involved in things and get to dabble in things without actually having to declare a major. You also see some study abroad mentioned here. We are ranked number one for the number of students who study abroad. So we have year long programs, semester long. We also have an interim. So the month of January, it's like a J term or we call it interim. And students just take one class for that one month. So that's a really great time to study abroad. And we offer about 30 different um, study abroad programs that are specific to St. Olaf that take place during that month. So when I was a student, I did a program called Theater in London, um, where we went to London and we saw 26 plays, 22 plays over the course of 26 days. Um, so that's just one example, but there's so many different cool ones. It's also a great time to do research. There's a lot of different research opportunities with professors or over the summer, um, or also getting off campus and into the Twin Cities. Another aspect of St. Olaf campus life is the residential aspect. So if you're not studying abroad, you're probably on campus. 95% of students live on campus all four years, which is not a number that you find just anywhere, but I think that it really makes St. Olaf unique. I think that students really want to be at St. Olaf and they want to participate in that community. And so, you know, we're in a small town, but there are a lot of things going on during the weekends. Um, we have over 200 clubs and student organizations. So students are often very active and involved. I mentioned that, you know, you don't have to be a music major to be in an ensemble or audition for a theater production, but we also have intramurals and sports and we have um, academic clubs and social, political, cultural. So there's always things happening on the weekends. We also have pretty good food. I'm not saying that's the only reason you need to choose a college, but I think that is a factor. We have one campus dining hall. So you also really feel that sense of community in the one dining hall where you just see your friends or faculty throughout the day. And it's a really nice kind of gathering space for students to come together and share a meal. Let's see, when it comes to Applying to schools, I know a question was asked about um, how financial aid works. So St. Olaf being a liberal arts private institution, we have one comprehensive fee. So that's in state or out of state. Um, but we also have a commitment to meeting 100% of demonstrated financial need. So we really focus our financial aid on need-based efforts and have two different forms that you fill out to apply for need-based financial aid um, and really try to meet your family's need to get to the comprehensive fee to make St. Olaf affordable and accessible. 
We also offer some small merit scholarships. So that's typically you're kind of considered for those throughout the admissions process. The only ones that have a separate application would be the fine arts scholarships. And you can see our different application deadlines listed out. Obviously that's still a little ways away, but um, basically early decision is like a binding agreement. So that's if St. Olaf is your first choice. Otherwise the other two deadlines are perfectly great for me. And then lastly, we just really, um, we want to set students up for success. I think that when you're thinking about college, it's important to think about what are you going to do those four years? What are those going to look like? But also what's life gonna look like after those four years? And so we have a great Piper Center, which is our career center that works with students and helps them with networking and applying for jobs, um, helps you research grad schools. So we have a really strong focus also on kind of the outcomes of a St. Olaf education. And encourage you to um, check out go.stainolof.edu backslash visit because that's where you can learn more and sign up for admissions events um, or feel free to reach out to me directly because I work with students from Loyola Academy so I'm always happy to have a conversation. Thanks everyone. All right, thank you so much Emily. All right we only have about two minutes left so I do want to go around very quickly to all the panelists to ask just one simple question for you all. Uh, to make it really easy, we will. Uh, why don't you just tell us one quick interesting fact about your school? How about we start with Hope first? Putting me on the spot. All right. One interesting fact about WashU is that we have hosted the most presidential or vice presidential debates out of any university in the country. Our latest was in 2016 with Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton. Excellent. David. Ah, all right, so a uh, really interesting fact would be that we're maybe the only college in the United States who can claim alumni who have won a Super Bowl, a World Cup, and have been director of the CIA and the FBI. <laughs> awesome. Patrick? Yeah, uh, one quick fun fact about Suffolk is that one of our residence halls on campus, One Court Street, is actually the first skyscraper ever built in the city of Boston. Awesome. April? Um, one of our alumni is president right now. <laughs> Excellent. Island. Uh, six days after the United States officially became a country uh, with the signing of the Treaty of Paris, uh, Dickinson College was chartered, uh, making us the first college chartered once the United States became an official country. Well, and Emily. Um, our school fight song is in three, four time. So if you want to learn the words to um, ya, ya, that's our fight song. Excellent. Well, thank you, everyone. Thank you, panelists, for joining us. And thank you to all of our tent attendees. We hope we were able to answer all of your questions in the Q&A. And that wraps up the end of our session today. Thank you for joining. When you close your window, you'll have a quick four question survey that will appear. And we hope you can answer those four questions for us. And this recording will be available at strivescan.com slash Loyola. Thank you everyone for joining us today and you have a good evening. Take care all, bye-bye.